Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're well today on this Wednesday afternoon. And may the Lord bless you wherever you are. Have you ever thought about the blessings of God? Have you ever thought about how much Jesus loves you and me? I mean, what a, what a great thing. What a wonderful thing to know that he loves us so much. Today, I want to share with you just a few nuggets. And I want to start down with uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and starting down with verse... Let's see, uh, 23. It said, But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting uh, those who are in, in opposition, if God perhaps would grant them repentance to uh, so that they may know the truth so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil and having been uh, taken captive by him to do his will. Father, we pray right now that you will bless this time, bless these words. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. May those who are listening today, may they be blessed and may your word and may your spirit penetrate through the depths of their soul and touch them that they may be changed and transformed, not by might nor by power, but by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have you ever thought about how fearful the devil is of us as God's people? He's so fearful that he never leaves us alone because he's contending to take our soul. It reminds me of a story where a young man took his son to the zoo. And as he took him to the zoo, the little boy looks down into the cage and he sees this roaring lion. I mean, he's making terrible sounds and the boy is fearful for his life. But he couldn't understand the calmness of his father because his father knew that that lion was in a cage and he could not hinder his son nor him. And much like us Christians sometimes, we think that we are in the cage and not the enemy himself. If we let the devil see it the way we, we see it, he would put us in the cage. But in all respects, the devil himself is caged in and he will forevermore be caged because the scripture says, behold, I've given unto you the power to tread upon the serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by enemies hurt us. You see, and that's what the father of that son saw, that, that that lion was caged in and not him. He didn't have anything to worry about. That's the way we need to see the enemy. He is the one caged in and not us. We are free. We have victory in Christ Jesus. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. I heard an excerpt the other day as I was reading a, a guy by the name of Dr. W.A. Criswell, a former pastor of Dallas, Texas. And some parishioner came up to him many years ago and said, Pastor, will we know each other when we get to heaven? And the pastor looked at them with grace and mercy. He said, when we get to heaven, we really won't know anybody until we get there. In other words, the true self will come out. You see, that's why we must live this journey now as holy and righteous people before God. It doesn't matter sometimes what we do behind closed doors as long as it's in the eyes of God and it's a righteous thing. You see, as I said before, we may not get credit for everything that we do right now. The eyes of the Lord is in every place. God is seeing what you're doing. He's watching yours and my heart. That is the love of God. We may not know each other when we get to heaven, but we'll know each other even better when we get to heaven. You see, one of the things I've learned a long time ago is that heaven is going to be a community. Hell is an isolation. 
You don't want to go there, my friend. I want to go where there is community. You see, this is why this pandemic is such a crisis to us because God created us to be social beings. He created us to be a community of people. That's why I can't wait until the church doors began to open again because I miss you folks. I miss coming together as a community. I do not want to be in isolation. And that's what hell is to those who don't believe the person of Jesus Christ. You see, hell is true, seen too late. You don't want to be too late, my friend. You want to be on time. And simply by saying, Lord, come into my life. Uh, C.S. Lewis once said this right here, hell is a sobering reality for those who don't believe. I want you to know, my friend, you don't have to be in that situation and say, I'm going to wait to the last minute. I've had, years ago, I had a great friend who was fishing at, uh, up under the Golden Gate Bridge. Great friend, he had been in the Navy for many, many years. I mean, this guy could do anything and everything. He, he had been in the Navy, he had gotten out, he was on his little fishing boat, and I don't know if you've ever been up under the Golden Bridge, Golden Gate Bridge, but you'll see literally the color of the water change from the ocean that's emerging with the bay because the bay water is a lot warmer and muggy. And you see that kind of crystal blue water from the ocean that's merging with the, with the, uh, with the bay uh, as a whole. But my friend was fishing and as he was fishing, that's a young man was on top of the Golden Gate Bridge. And, I, you know, it's not many people that I've actually told this story, but I just kind of remembered it as I was thinking about it. And the young man was going to commit suicide. He actually jumped off the bridge. My friend, great swimmer, jumped in the freezing cold water. And he was able to take his jeans off to float on that because he was such a great swimmer. I mean, he, he's just a magnificent person. And you thought, and he saved this kid's life. He saved his life. And he came from a very wealthy family. And one of the things he said is that most people that jump off the Golden Gate Bridge, the last thing they say after they jump, what have I done? And folks, that's the way sometimes it is when you see people who are going into eternity without Jesus Christ. They have made their life here thinking that, hey, it's not a big deal. But it is a big deal because this is not our home, my friend. This, this is just a transit. Listen, you, I, don't, I haven't seen anybody that would go to an airport and try to change the decor of the restrooms in the airport. You don't do that. You go in there, you utilize the facilities for the time being because you know you're just passing through and it's just a transit. You get, you got to get home or to your destination where you're going to be before you actually feel comfortable. But you utilize those little amenities until you get to the place that you really want to be. Folks, this is just a transit. This is not our permanent home. And that's why we need Jesus in our lives. I remember reading uh, not too long ago where someone asked the father of four children and they asked him, they said, uh, why do you love your children? He said, with a profound thought on his face, he said, because they are mine. And there is no need to do anything for them to prove themselves to me as their father. Because you know what? He took them as they were. So it is with God for us. He takes us as we are. That's the love of God. He loves us as we are. And that's why his love motivates us to trust him and obey him in every situation in our life. Isn't that a wonderful thing? When you stop and think about it, we are to trust and obey him because he loves us so much. I heard uh, once that Jesus said this, when we ask the question, Jesus, how much do you love us? How much do you love me, Lord? He stretched open his arms and he says, this much. And then he died. That's how much Jesus loves you and I. We have to do everything we can 
and, and my vision, people have always asked me, what is your vision for the church, for God's people? My vision, let me tell you what my vision is. My vision is to make it to heaven and to take as many people with me as I can. I can't think of a greater mission than that right there. No matter how I do it, by serving, by giving, by doing, it doesn't matter. I want to get to heaven and take as many people with me as I possibly can. And how do I do this? By loving like Jesus and dying like him. Not in the physical sense necessarily, but definitely in the spiritual sense. As the Epistle Paul said in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Oh, my friend, you don't know what real living is until you understand the love of God and the price that he paid. There's an old hymn that goes like this. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I cannot pay. And see, that's what it is. See, when we stop and think of the love of Christ and all that he does for us and accepts us as we are with all our frailties, with all our mistakes, with all our brokenness, and he still loves us and accepts us who we are. You see, Jesus is in the business of restoring and healing and making us new people in Christ Jesus. How do I get that, Pastor? You simply got to be sincere. You got to come with a repentant heart. You simply got to say, Lord, I don't have anywhere else to go. You're all I got. Lord, you're the only one who knows me better than anyone else. In fact, you know me better than myself. Lord, I'm a broken man. I cannot go any longer without your help. I need your guidance. I need your direction. But more than anything, I need your saving grace. Lord, I surrender my life to you. Will you help me? Will you come into my life? Will you change me, Lord, to be a better person, to be a better man, to be a better father? to be a better husband, to be a better friend, to be holistically all that you would have me to be. Lord, I repent. I ask that you change my soul and make me whole. I believe you are the son of the living God. And Lord, I got to believe that you died and three days later, you rose again. So I give my life to you. I give my life. And that's all Jesus wants. It's for you and I to give our life to him. You know what he wants? He wants your heart. You give him that because you know what? He gave his life for you and me. I pray that wherever you are tonight, that you would experience the love of God. And that no matter what you have done, no matter what circumstances that you have been in, God is able to pour you out of that mess, to revolutionize you, to change you, to transform you because his love for you is more than the world can ever offer or anything else. I pray that God will bless you, that you will see the hand of God gently moving in your life. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, I pray your blessings upon this few moments of time that the spirit of the living God will speak to those who so desperately need your touch. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. God bless you, and we will see you soon. Amen.